Watch this. Remember the pandemic? Yeah, we're still technically in it. COVID is still a thing, and it's still a thing we should be concerned about, apparently. Especially given the news, the virus can be carried and evolve in animals, not just in us. The Broncos are dominating again, and I'm not talking about the football team. Boise State's eSports team, again undefeated and raking in the rewards. A Thanksgiving football game, a free pair of trousers, and the most interesting PTA meeting. We're looking at headlines from 100 years ago. It may seem like eons ago, but there was a time when COVID talk dominated our days and our shows. It was only a little more than two years ago, by the way. And despite the virus dropping off our daily focus and our radar, it's still the focus of scientists and healthcare experts. And those people are raising the red flag when it comes to the latest COVID concern. The COVID virus can be carried by animals. We know that. That's how it started. But now there's a new wrinkle with how it affects and evolves with animals and how that could be a concern, not just for the upcoming holidays, but maybe for a decade from now. Here's Joe Paris. Just this afternoon, the department was notified by our Bureau of Laboratories that we have our first positive case of novel coronavirus. It's been 990 days since the state of Idaho announced its first confirmed case of COVID. Two calendar years later, socially, most people have moved on from the virus and virus protocols. Clearly, the activity's out there. Dr. David Pate is the retired president and CEO of St. Luke's Health and a member of Governor Little's coronavirus working group. He says the COVID data for Idaho and abroad looks a lot different now than it did in the past. And no, it's not because the virus just went away. There's a lot of home testing being done uh, and then a lot of people not even testing. With poor data samples to draw from, it is hard to gauge what the complete spread of COVID looks like across Idaho. Yes, the state is in much better shape than it was in January of this year when Idaho saw dire situations in hospitals. But a better situation does not mean the situation is complete. This has been unlike the typical kinds of peaks and, and valleys that we've had uh, previously, where this has just kind of gone up and then kind of come down and just kind of hovered at a, a still a pretty high level of transmission. New research on the COVID virus and its interactions with non-human animals highlights the fact that since 2020, yes, we've learned a lot about the virus, but there is still an incredible amount to still learn. Scientists have identified dozens of animals in the United States that have been infected with COVID and at least two species that can transmit the virus back to humans with new mutations. Now, those mutations can be dangerous, helping a COVID virus become more contagious or deadly or simply keeping the virus alive. The list of animals infected with strains of COVID now include rats, specifically rats tested in New York City. What was shocking is that 16 and a half percent of them had antibodies, meaning they had been infected at some point. 16.5 percent of millions of rats is a big number. The new research published by a group of reputable experts concludes, quote, in summary, we found that rats in the NYC sewage system have been exposed to the coronavirus and that the Delta and Omicron variants can infect rats in addition to the Alpha and Beta variants. Our findings highlight the potential risk of secondary zoonotic transmission from rats and the need for further monitoring of the coronavirus in wild rat populations. The only virus we've ever uh, eradicated was smallpox, and that was because it doesn't get into any animals. I think we have missed many, many chances to potentially eradicate this virus. I don't think we can really think of that anymore because it's in so much of the animal kingdom as well as uh, in humans. The Delta variant of COVID, the variant that powered a major Idaho infection wave earlier this year, it's also been found inside immunocompromised people who evidently did not clear the variant. That fact, along with the research into animals, it illustrates a circuit of continuous COVID. It's less of a concern about animals, more of a concern that we've got some immunocompromised people out there that have Delta still in them. If you remember back, Delta was really bad for filling our ICUs and people dying. And, and so that's a very bad form of this virus. And if they still have it, and now what has happened, because we've allowed this virus to keep on changing, the main drug we give immunocompromised people to protect them no longer works against a lot of these. Now the worry is that 
Omicron of some type will infect them. And what we've also seen this year is a lot of recombinations, meaning that you can have this strain and this strain, and then a new one that kind of uh, contains features of the old and the other come together and you now have a new version. Experts know a lot more about COVID than they did even beginning of this year, but they still have a lot to learn and they have to still answer major questions like, what could a COVID infection now mean in terms of long-term health impacts decades down the line? Unfortunately, we will uh, have a great understanding of this virus. It may be 10 years, it may be 20. At some point, we will have a very good uh, understanding. I, what my fear is, Joe, is because uh, there are other viruses that people dismiss but cause long-term problems. Uh, we have uh, at least eight viruses that are what we call oncogenic, can lead to cancer. Uh, and so, for example, human papillomavirus, uh, we know that that can cause a number of different uh, vir uh, cancers, and that's why we came up with a vaccine for it. So what do the numbers look like in recent weeks? Well, the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare reports that the statewide PCR percent positivity increased last week from a revised 6.6% to 7.6%, so increasing by 1% over the last week. Idaho is also reporting more than half a million total cases of COVID-19, including more than 1,400 new ones since the previous Friday, not last Friday, the previous Friday. State of Idaho also has more than 5,200 deaths to date since the beginning of COVID. Uh, Brian, I, I know that it's not something we talk about on a daily basis here, but in the background of all of our lives, the virus continues to do what it does. Well, you said a, a continuous circuit of COVID kind of thing. What does this mean, like, as you said, going forward from here? It's going to be with us always? There's no chance of eradicating this? It's going to be very hard to eradicate this virus, according to doctors like Dr. Pate, because of the fact that the virus can continue to circulate through non-humans. So even if we got it all the way out of the uh, humans, all humans on Earth had no more COVID, it's still circulating through mammals, and there are some mammals that can, you know, transmit it back and forth. So how do we, you know, take this on? What do we do going forward? What's the call to action? Dr. Pate says going forward, he thinks that air purification or using like special UV light to kind of clean out the air, especially in places like schools or business offices, that's going to be really popular in the near future because of the fact that, yes, this virus is still around. We have people that are immunocompromised. It's tough. I mean, I'm laughing because it's a continuous circuit. We were just talking about these lights and these air purifiers two years ago. Like, that was a new thing, and now that's going to be the way we're going next. So did you see them installed everywhere? Some places, yes. Not everywhere. Some places. So there you go. All right. Thank you, Joe. All right. Well, a little something <laughs> slipped under our radar a couple of weeks ago. A little something that is a pretty big deal for Boise State and their eSports program. Dare I say, a more dominant program than their football counterparts. Two weeks ago, they not only won their second consecutive Mountain West Rocket League championship, but in doing so, extended their undefeated record to 17-0. Beat that, Coach Avalos. But that's not all. A week before that push to perfection, the entire program earned an even bigger recognition. A Tempest Award for the best collegiate eSports program in the entire country. What is that? Well, it's something that is awarded each year to shine a spotlight on innovation driving the competitive gaming industry. I know, I had to look it up too. Anyway, accepting the award for the Broncos, the man who started the program just five years ago, Dr. Chris or Doc Haskell. Every group in this, uh, in this room is a small collection of really hardworking people. Nobody has the staff they need or the time that they need. And it reminds me, a group of people was called together, a very small group, to move a grand piano about the size of any one of these tables. Um, they weren't strong enough to do it. None of them were individually strong. But one wise one said, okay, just spread out evenly and lift where you stand. And every one of these tables, every one of these groups is like our little group at Boise State or at Hawaii or at Clark University. Shift to your superstar. And we all have to lift where we stand. We're able to do things that we shouldn't be able to do with the small groups uh, that we have. Kind of sums it up for them, doesn't it? Small groups that they have moving big things. Well, the Bronco eSports team has been moving grand pianos for years. As we found out years ago, when we too were wondering, what is Rocket League or even Overwatch anyway? <laughs> It's flashy and full blast and fan friendly. It's also fast paced and sometimes hard to follow with so many moving parts. All are good descriptions of sports at Boise State. 
even those that are played in padded chairs. Be careful. Play left, play left. This is BSU eSports. And like basketball, they're coming right side. Yeah, win them, win them. they play as a team. Underneath, underneath, underneath. Bottom, bottom, bottom. They compete against other colleges. Almost up. Right there. Right there. Right they have their own right casters. And they have a faction of fans. He's killing people. And family. Uh, we don't even know which one my son is, really. That fill any empty space in the arena. So yeah, it's pretty much same scene, just different diversion. The only difference in esports is really just the E. That may be a bold statement, but not necessarily an overstatement. Just like other sports, game day performance is a product of practice. Reaper one, reaper one. Which they do in a second floor classroom on campus, stocked with computers where the team's 65 players can sharpen their skills. Pass me. Sometimes, Does it pass? like it's a full-time job. I'm playing a lot more than most people. I have about 45 hours a week. Only 20 of those hours are spent here since, just like other varsity sports, instruction time is limited. Reaper up top. What hasn't been limited? Try to call after Shatter too. The progress of the program. It's pretty crazy how much it's grown like, in the past few years. And I discovered very quickly. In 2016, Dr. Chris Haskell was doing some research on gaming. That esports was about to explode and that we had this kind of generational opportunity to be the first. That September, two dozen student athletes showed up and showed an interest in getting a gaming team going. You're going to school for gaming? What? How do you do that? Senior Madison Benge, Mercy down. or Nerdy Bird as she's known on the screen, Minus one. was one of the originals. At that time, there were only seven other varsity esports teams across the country. Today, there are more than 170 member schools in the National Association of Collegiate Esports. So how does Boise State fit in in that field? We're really good at some of these games. Let's put it this way. No other Boise State program in any sport has gone from formation to domination in such a short time. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Boise State eSports broadcast. From their first games in early 2017 to now, there we go. they've won more than 250 matches. We have the most uh, wins of any collegiate program right now. The wins line up like the list of other Bronco accolades. We've played more games. We have the biggest broadcasting program associated with our esports program. We had the first female team captain in collegiate esports. Tries to clear it out. Any year, we're probably the third most watched program on campus. And they're ranked top 10 in all four games they play. However, it makes it so they can't get under the ball. Yeah, they just scored. Including Rocket League. Car soccer with rockets. <laughs> That's about it. And Overwatch, which is a bit more complicated. I have no clue what's going on. Darren Strickler has watched his son Garrett play four times before. He's eliminating people. And while he's still not sure what's happening in the game, he recognizes what's happening in today's collegiate landscape. After all the years of me telling him not to play games, he's up here playing in college, so it's good. And soon, his son could be playing games on a scholarship, just like any other athlete, something the professor turned coach Doc Haskell sees as the next step to making going to school and getting a degree more attractive to the next generation. To let them keep doing the thing that they're really good at for the university in the process of becoming the next version of themselves. That's collegiate athletics. So is it sports? Debatable. What isn't? The fact that esports aren't going anywhere, and they're likely going to get more popular. Somewhere between football and probably field hockey. All right. Probably closer to football. I'm hearing something on our left. Careful. This is esports. There's no gender involved. There's no age involved. It's how well can you play this game? How much are you willing to learn? How much are you willing to grind in this game to get better? All right. I guess just like any other game. A game is never going to die. It's just going to evolve. And it certainly has evolved. By the way, when we did that story, there were 100, more than 100 members of the NACE, uh, the National Association. Well, there's now more than 170 plus. So this, by the way, is the first Tempest Award for the BSU eSports program. In its six years of existence, they have won more than 1,400 matches, and they've also won a 
ton of national championships in a whole slew of different games. They've won conference championships, several coach of the year awards, a broadcast team of the year award, which was featured there. They also had nearly a dozen academic All-Americans. So their trophy case is getting pretty full. And yes, they do offer scholarships now. By the way, besides that conference championship, the Broncos are going to play in the national championships coming up this Saturday in Philly against UT Dallas. And you can follow them on Twitch and they have a match again, like I said, coming up this Saturday in Philly. Oh, it was a dry time back in 1922 and we aren't talking about the pre winter weather. Keeping dry, though, was not what happened on a certain bird hunting expedition. Oh, the times they were having a hundred years ago today, according to the Caldwell Tribune. All right, what's on your mind? You got any comments? Any questions? Any concerns? You can text them to us, 208-321-5614. Don't forget to include your name and, of course, the hashtag, the 208. And as usual, keep them clean, keep them short, and keep them clever, because we might share a few at the end of the show. Well, if you thought that eSports story was old news, how about this? We like to do this once in a while, where we take a look at the social media pages of days gone by. Well, those pages from days gone by were actual pages, and you'd get ink on your fingers. And in doing so, you get the scoop on the goings-on of your neighbors, you know, who's selling what at the local shop, that kind of stuff. In this installation of This Day in History, we take a look at this week's edition of the Caldwell Tribune from 1922. Yes, the Caldwell Tribune, November. It was a battle on the gridiron as the Whitman College football team visited the College of Idaho for Thanksgiving. Fans say it was a real game. Meanwhile, a newspaper man met his match on the Boise River while bird hunting. He shot two birds that ended up in the water, forcing Harold Jennis to borrow a boat. He got the birds, but his chauffeur stole his money, gun, and watch, leaving Jennis high and dry. Prohibitionists were excited as a dry Congress was elected to Washington. In case you've missed it, those that are wet are in favor of alcohol and dry in favor of banning booze. George, the boy reporter, stated that Daphne Gowan will come home for Christmas to see what's doing around the mantelpiece. Mr. Thorne at the Fort Play sold a coop to some good-looking girl from Parma. I guess she's got money because she had on a big diamond ring. And Frank Weaver was giving away an extra pair of trousers for free with the purchase of a full hand-tailored man's suit. And Surges, tweeds and cashmeres are all for only 30 bucks. Interested in what was going around in our territory? In notice, Mr. and Mrs. H.B. Jones left for San Francisco via Pocatello, and the two lower rooms at the school are preparing for a Thanksgiving program. In Midway, the PTA held the most interesting meeting consisting of business, projects, and performance of America the Beautiful. Oh, and don't forget, if your back hurts, flush the kidneys, eat less meat, and also take a glass of salt before breakfast. That's right, a glass of salt before breakfast. 
only occasionally. In other news, controversy at the high school over the dress code. Male students, or flappers as they're referred to, should refrain from appearing in peon pants and wear true American garb. And a new resident has taken over to the county jail. Billy Buchanan was arrested for drunken disorderly conduct. He pled guilty and is sentenced to 90 days in the Bastille. And that is all that's fit to print in the news from the week, November 1922. Parsley. Going outside tonight, if you take a look here, here's the southeast Boise camera glacier, the whole city down through here, all the clouds that we have above. And yeah, there's still a few snow flurries for tonight possible, uh, even up to about 10 to 11 o'clock for this evening. But here's what's going on. Next storm. The next storm, here's a winter weather watch out throughout Cascade, all to the north. Oh, there could be in some of those mountain locations as much as 20 inches of snow on the mountaintops. Uh, anywhere from about 18 to 15 inches of snow that could come down in some of the lower valley areas. So it's a wait and see thing. The storm system is going to be coming in later tomorrow night. We'll be watching that closely here in the valley. Like I said, the storms later tomorrow night. So tomorrow is just a cold day, a little breezy at times, a little sunshine east of Mountain Home. Uh, the winds could get rather gusty, but let me show you what's going on here. Here's Tuesday. Here's one computer model. Uh, which shows for late Wednesday night into early Friday, late Thursday evening. Look at the amount of snow. Now this is what it has for the valley. This is if it's all snow that comes into the area. We're looking anywhere from two to four inches up in the mountains. Some of the mountain tops could have 15 to 20 inches of snow. Now let me show you another computer model. This is one that will show us if we get a little rain in that snow, which is the possibility and, and also a little effect from the, the south from the Owyhee Mountains uh, as we see this storm coming up from the southwest. So this is showing us just a little bit over an inch because as you know, uh, some of the rain mixed in with the snow could keep that snow level down. So that's showing us anywhere from one to four inches of snow from Wednesday morning through Friday morning.
Up in mountain locations, there could be anywhere from about 8 to 15 inches of snow, but 20 inches of snow on some of those mountaintop ski resorts. Man, you are looking great. It's cold tonight, down to 18 degrees, so drive for tomorrow. Here's the snow begins, which is on Wednesday. On uh, Thursday, some rain snow mixed in, so that's why we have a little difference in some of the accumulation around the area. Same thing for Friday, but as it gets a little colder, we see all this snow coming up in the mountains. It breaks up a little, but guess what? Next week, more snow heading our way, and especially in those mountains. Mm -hmm. Time to get to your comments. And yes, we talked about COVID today for the first time in a long time. And Charlie says, well, she may be the only one who does this, but she still wears their masks to prevent getting COVID. And it's sad that we are an exception. How many of us still have a mask or two in the car? Maybe a box of them laying around the house still? Esports, are they actually sports? Is chess or Monopoly? How about dog breeding, all of which are done competitively? competitively. So why are we looking at video games as somehow being a sport, asked Jack. In, uh, well, how about this? What about golf? Is it a sport or is it a game, right? Well, eSports considered a sport, I guess. And also a reminder from uh, Teresa saying that Twitch, yeah, this is where you can watch those of us who don't know what Twitch is. That's where you can see the video games being played by the Boise Sports, Boise eSports team. Let me get that straight. We'll see you tomorrow.